the thing for me, the thing for me is is simple. When a program's back, you got to do it more than one year. Uh, okay, like it's different for different coaches. Okay, mm -hmm. it's different for different programs. When Urban Meyer went to Ohio State, they were instantly back, instantly. With, without question, they were back. When I think that Nick Saban went to Alabama, they were back. When Brian Kelly to LSU, they were back. When Lincoln Riley went to USC, USC their yeah. standards, you know, they were back. The problem that I have, okay, is that's not what Sark is. We make all these things about Sark. He is one of, if not the best play caller in college football. You can't take that away from him. The problem that I have with Sark, though, is pretty simple. How many years does he have to go being a head coach and not having 10 wins? See, the media, like I was talking about this the other day, and somebody's like, wait, he never got 10 wins at Washington? And I'm like, no, not even, no, no he didn't get 10 wins at Washington. Didn't get he was 10 barely wins. there. He wasn't there barely that long. Barely there. He didn't get 10 wins at USC. He hasn't gotten to the 10-win mark at Texas. The first time that Steve Sarkeesian has a 10-win season will be his first. He's a great play caller, okay? You did the same exact thing with Tom Herman. You went and got a really good play caller with a little bit of head coaching experience. If they were in the SEC this year, you wouldn't be back because they would get beat. Look, every year we go through this same monologue over and over and over and over again about Texas being back. Now, I will say, I do think that they're the most talented team in the Big 12. I don't think it's remotely close. Mm -mm. Because I I look at them, Savior Worthy and a, a Savior Worthy and a Donnie Mitchell is, are going to be one of the best two wide receiver do or wide receiver duo in the country if yeah. they have a good enough quarterback. Yeah. I look at what they have going on at tight end with Sanders and Helm and Davis. I think that they're they're pretty damn good at tight end. They got Kelvin Banks returning at left tackle. They have Cole Hurston. They have Christopher Jones. They're really built along the offensive line. They're going to be a pretty damn good team. But the thing that I'm going to ultimately, and I think what the country's ultimately going to look at them at, what are you doing week two against Alabama? If Alabama, with a down, quote-unquote, roster or team this year, if, they, if the score is 42 to 20, Joe, and they get beat bad, then what? Then, then what do we start talking about? They have talent. Can they put it all together? Coaching, play calling, can they put it all together? Very, I, I've said this on previous shows. I'll continue to say this. Texas and Texas A&M are the most intriguing teams in the country to me, mm. Not I mean, based out of my fandom. Okay, I have, a lot, I have a couple of them that I'm really interested in, but both of those Texas schools have a lot of talent or – on paper talent, well, it's time to show it. And it's time for them to show that they can do something. But, Joe, I'm not confident that they win the Big 12. I don't think anybody remotely can come out here and say, I'm 100% confident that they're going to be one of the top two teams. Because you have a team like TCU. Joe, TCU has had better program stability than Texas has. Yes. Yeah. So, at, at what point? Baylor, for all the shit – that they've been through, Joe, they've won more Big 12 title games the last 10 years in Texas, if I'm not mistaken, or eight. Regardless, how are you not going to win the Big 12 title game and, and for me to come in here and say that you're back? It doesn't take one year. It takes multiple years. So I mm. look at them as a team, and it, what's sad is, Joe, we don't talk about them enough as a team. We talk about the well, are they back and it's Sark and all this kind of stuff. And the last thing I will say is this. Y'all can have faith in Quinn Ewers, but the best quarterback right now on that roster, college quarterback right now on that roster, what do you think I'm about to say? Arch Manning. No. Who? I think it's Malik Murphy. Really? Yeah. Dude, did you not see him go absolutely nuts? Uh... He he made he made Quinn Ewers look like he was throwing paper mache. I don't want to dive too far down that rabbit hole. I want okay. to I want, I want to talk on some of the other things that you said because I there's a, there's a really big part to because I I you know I'm going to be honest with you I don't know enough about Malik Murphy to 
provide enough. I, I think the Quinn Ewers is is he might he, the guy to get them. Might there. be he might be Anthony Richardson on a more talented team. Again, I don't know enough about him. He's not that fast, but Joe, when you watch him run, it is mm -hmm. and throw. Joe, you're talking about a former shortstop. You're talking about a kid like it's not. Maybe they work him in as a as a wildcat guy if that ends. Well, up. it's not it's not Jalen Milrow. Okay, he's not yeah. Jalen Milrow. He's more Anthony Richardson than he is Jalen Milrow. Is that okay? Yeah, that makes sense. He's more KJ Jefferson than God bless his heart, Jalen Milrow. So Blake, a lot of what you said there, I think we're in alignment here. I think that this Texas team in 2023, in terms of athletic talent on paper, names, Jalen Ford, Quinn Ewers, Jatavian Sanders, all of these guys, former five stars, projectable, highly draftable draft prospects. They have a top five roster in all of college football in terms of talent. But when you dive deep, when you actually watch the film and watch these guys individually and you break them down, they are very underdeveloped. They have not been properly coached up and developed. A guy like Jalen Ford is a really good example because he is a hell of a linebacker. But I watched him this past week, and the guy's decision-making is like three steps too slow for him to be an elite football player. I agree with I think that. that epitomizes the whole team, Blake, and everything that you just talked about there. Sark has not done a good enough job developing this talent. So why am I going to sit here in 2023 – and make a decision based on the talent and saying that this team is going to be elite and they're going to win the Big 12 and that they're going to put up a fight against Alabama when Sark, in his whole time as a head coach, his track record has been not properly coaching and developing talent. I don't have faith in that at all. And I'm not going to put my chips on the table for a guy who has no to little success rate of developing guys. And I think, again, Quinn Ewers is another player who you talked about fits really well into this mix where – He's got one of the biggest arms in the country. He's got one of the best, just pure arm talent, throwing the football on the run, moving one of the best arms in the country. But if we try to place him in the rankings of top quarterbacks, he doesn't fit anywhere in the top 15 because he is mistake prone. He's incredibly mistake prone and he's very inaccurate. Highly I, I, inaccurate. Highly inaccurate. There are so many positives to this team. And if we just, Look at all these players. It's like, wow, look what they can be. I don't, I just don't right. think that they get there. They have not done that successfully in any of the time that Sark has been there. You know, I look at a guy like Mac Jones. Just st stay with me on this one, okay? Just yeah. Stay with me, okay? Sark helped develop him. I look at a guy like Mac Jones, where Mac decision making got work, got better under Sark, but he was always a pretty accurate dude. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, he was always pretty accurate. I think, it, like, Burrow comes to mind. You know, another guy that comes to mind is, in college, let's not go pros, is Baker Mayfield. You know, I look at a guy from year one to year two. Like, I look at um, Deshaun Watson. He might have thrown 17 interceptions in the second year, but his completion percentage went up. Why? Because, yeah, he made 17 bad decisions. Okay? But he was still highly accurate. I have not seen enough from Quinn Ewers that he can convince me that he can be an accurate dude. Now, we turn on the film. See, here's the crazy part, Joe, is everybody's like, oh, well, look what he was doing against Alabama. Okay. Well, what did he do for the rest of the season? Everybody's like, well, he was hurt. Uh, Joe, everybody's hurt. Like, it, it, it's the biggest thing. It, when everybody says that, it just confirms to me that you've never played. Joe, you know and I know, yeah. by week one to week 13, week one, you probably feel the best. Week 13, you need three or four weeks to regroup yourself because you've been through so many car crashes, okay? Everybody's hurt. It doesn't make them bad decision makers. It doesn't make them more inaccurate. When, they're, when I watch Washington, Joe, he had a month to recover, okay? Quinn Ewers had a month to recover before the Washington game. He had one of the best receivers in the country, one of the best tight ends in the country. Michael Penix outplayed him, and they had less talent. Can he develop is going to be a massive question for me. I don't know if he's the dude. And if they want to go where they think that they can go, 
it's it's always on the backs of quarterbacks. I know that you'll say Stetson Bennett didn't. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But historically, yes. historically, teams that are really dominating, not they just have really solid quarterback play. I think you can say Stetson was solid because he did lead them, and he was a solid signal caller. He was a good game manager, whatever yes. you want to call him. Yes. But, Joe, you go from Stetson Bennett the last two years, Mac Jones, you got uh, Joe Burrow, you have um, Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields. What did all of them do? All of those teams playing for national titles or winning national titles is simply due to one thing. They had dynamic quarterback play at times or a guy that can manage enough and do enough and not make mistakes. I'm sorry to tell everybody on planet Earth, right now to me, until I can see it, I have to see it, Quinn's not that dude, man. He's not that – I don't care that he's got Zen in his, in his, in his pocket at media days. That actually compo- – you're wearing jeans at media days? <laughs> like you're wearing jeans at media – like what are we, like, what are we doing here? There, there are decision-making things that I just start – like why? Again. When I put them, though, Joe, on this pedestal on the Big 12, mm-hmm. who's going to beat them, though? There's not a team right – do I think that they'll get beat by somebody in the Big 12? Yes. But it's it's a toss-up. It's a, it, there's, I, no, there's no team – there's no reason whatsoever – Texas should lose any game in the Big 12, and I think everybody knows that, but they will. There, there shouldn't be any games that they lose, but I just think that there are, are so many more better coach teams in the Big 12. I, I, I think that Oklahoma is a better coach team than Texas, and I know that you know the comments are going to be littered with people saying in the, in the clipped version of this, they're like, oh, what the hell am I talking about? They won six games last year. I have more faith in Brenton Venables to coach up that defense and to coach up that team than I do for Steve Sarkeesian. I, I, and to what we're talking about, like TCU lost a bunch of guys, but at the same time, they outplayed expectations last year. Like who, who is to say that they can't not go back and run the table and win the Big 12 again, but beat Texas again in 2023? Kansas State is another team that is just really well coached that has lesser athletes, not as many big name recruits, no, but, but it's just really well coached. Dudes, but they're yes. developing all those dudes. Though. Yes. All of these other teams are developing talent. I feel like Texas has a bunch of five stars and high four stars running around that didn't progress since high school. There has been no growth. But the one thing that I want to just continue the point that you were talking about, if we're to predict what leads to them being successful, just to kind of push back on poop, poop pooing them for a second, because we do that so much on this, uh, on this show. I, I think that their success all is going to all come down to what Quinn Ewers does. It's all going to come down to does Quinn Ewers play at an average to slightly above average level? Because last year he was below average in a number of games. I mean, we can go pull up his completion percentage. We can pull up the amount of interceptions that he threw, especially the way that he played against TCU and Oklahoma State. A lot of really below average games. If he comes out and he plays average to slightly above average, shows some sign of progression, they absolutely can win 10 games. They absolutely can win the Big 12. It's not like the competition is that stiff as we've talked about. But if he stays the same, there is no progression. They're sitting ducks. They're a nine to eight win team again, like they were last year. Well, they're off if they're if we're gonna go down, what do they have to do to have success? Yeah, you have to you, you all know that you have to have g- good quarterback play, really solid if above average. And even I've you know, we disagree on this all the time. Even like if, if he was St- like Joe, if he was Stetson Bennett, mm-hmm. okay, like if Quinn Ewers had this love same- bringing up Stetson Bennett. Well, just hang with me. I'm not trying to get I, into I, know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. If but if Quinn Ewers had around the same exact season statistically that Stetson did a year ago, they're going to win the Big 12. Yes. Okay, so 3,500 yards, 30 touchdowns, 
they're going to win the Big 12. The problem, though, is the only way right now that I could see that they win are, and win at a consistent rate this upcoming year, they're going to have to lean on that offensive line. They got a fifth-year tackle at right tackle. They have one of the best offensive tackles, in my opinion, in Banks at left tackle. They got solid play in the interior. But it's not the problem that I see, though, Joe, that they have right now. Everybody want, and their mama wants to talk to me about their front seven and defensive line. Well, the last time you've played teams that are worth a damn, you got dominated up front. Yeah. You don't I, have it. Your edge. Oh, and I will. I will say that. You no, know, when that they, offensive line showed up against Alabama. Alabama. That State offense. Half Alabama. They got dominated up okay. front. The all twenty-two copies don't lie. Come on now. Uh, I don't know if that was a dominant domination though. I've watched hey, that this game. This is a replay of Kansas game. State and Texas. You ready? A clapping. You're right. The, the amount of big bodies that they have and. They've been hyped up as being one of the best offensive lines in the country. The guys, they have all the dudes. And again, it fits the same theme that we're talking about here. The development and them getting to where they need to be to actually physically dominate people. It kind of gives that Ohio State sense where a lot of really highly recruited guys, a lot of really athletic players, but you know, can they put their hand in the dirt and can they run somebody the F over? I don't think so. I don't know if they can do that consistently. I'm also a little, con not concerned, but I'm wondering who, takes the load at running back. Is it Cedric Baxter? Is it the freshman who ends up being the guy? Well, I, they're going to have to. He, he's going to have to, okay? But, I mean, they have some – it's it's tough, Joe, because, I, I like, I look at them and I, I look down their recruiting class, okay? They did not have a running back in the – not this class, but the last class. Other than him, you're going to have to add depth to that running back position. And it, it, do they have enough dynamic playmakers at that position that can do anything besides him? Well, it doesn't, I don't think that they do. Right. It doesn't help that Bijan was the best running back in college football. And then Roshan Johnson was maybe the best backup running back in college football. The both, both those guys were really, really you're, good. Let's just call it, you're replacing two NFL backs. Yeah, like that's that's going to be a really difficult task. And to what we're talking about here with Quinn Ewers, if you want him to have a good season, if you want him to play well, you have to alleviate that pressure. You have to be able to run the ball the way that you did in games last year. The other thing, too, that pisses me off, and for some reason Texas fans didn't like that I pointed this out last year on my channel, I hate the decision-making by Sarkin games where when the run game isn't working, he immediately abandons it. And especially more than ever in modern college football, you have to keep going back to it to establish the run. You right. can't establish that, that physical upfront mentality if you don't keep trying to run the football. When Quinn tries to do everything, he plays like shit. And that's why he played like shit in a bunch of games last year. Because he tries to do everything. He tries to be Patrick Mahomes. And plainly... He's not him. He needs a supporting cast. He needs everything to work well around him. I need more of a commitment to the running game without Bijan and Roshan Johnson for them to be better this year. That was what cost them in a lot of games. Here's the truth now, too, because the when you look at the transfer portal, okay, sometimes it will lie to you. So let me give an example, okay? Mm -hmm. And you got to be careful with this. I think Colorado is a is a key marking this when you look at what they got in the portal they had a lot of departures a lot of depth piece departures okay when you, when I look at them from this past season okay I look at wide receiver okay you you add Mitchell but you lose Ben Ballard you lose Hudson Card okay well Hudson Card had experience what if Quinn Ewers does go down again you're playing a guy that has zero experience in uh, Malik and or the prodigy himself and Manning. It's not going to bode well. I look at receiver. They did add uh, They did add some key pieces in the freshman, but mm -hmm. they added a Donnie Mitchell. But they lose Brennan Thompson. They lose Troy. They lose Alexis. They lose Hall, who's still in the portal. I look at them on the offensive line. They lose Garth. They lose Parr. They lose Carrick. They lose Ange uh, Angeloa. So, again, 
you can have all the talented pieces that you want, but those depth pieces that they had are gone. So everybody's like, oh, well, they had a top five transfer portal class. Well, their depth is gone. And they didn't, they're replenishing it with really young dudes and freshmen. Historically, historically, that doesn't bode well. No. So you need, Joe, every time we see a contender, a, a real contender, what are three things that they have? We talk about one in solid quarterback play. Number two, you just got to have dudes. You got to have dudes that will punch somebody in the mouth in the street and slap somebody's grandmama. You need just dogs. Like, don't matter. But the third thing, you need senior depth and leadership. They got a, young dudes everywhere. And I do think that when – look, if you get into week two against Alabama and you come out of that game, even if you may win with some injuries – you got to turn right around, and you don't have the depth in place. So you, if anybody wants to do it themselves, you can go down that transfer portal list and watch. Damn, they had four depth pieces along the offensive line that left, and they did not replenish it other than freshmen. So that is a – nobody's talking about that. And I've waited, and I've waited, and I've waited to say that. I've told you weeks on weeks on weeks. You can have – like, what if Kelvin Banks goes down for a week, Joe? I mean, their offensive line – I actually would argue that their offensive line okay, is let me one of the better one. depth. But if they – say a Donnie Mitchell or, or Xavier Worthy, and Xavier Worthy was battling an injury last year, and he's a very slightly framed guy where he could suffer another injury. I, like, that's probably the thinnest position group for me is the receiving room. Okay, well – okay, so receivers. It doesn't matter. I don't yes, care. But I, I know you're probably saying. Have, they have a buck position in their defense, right? Uh -huh. What happens if uh, 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 Baron Sorrell goes down and you got a true uh, a freshman in tap that's got to come in? There Again, you're talking about inexperienced dudes, inexperienced players in that two line. You know what happens? I will tell you what happens. We've seen great coaches that have these issues. Urban Meyer, Florida, Ed Orgeron, LSU, uh, I would even make the argument, Dabo. Dabo does not have the depth that he once used to have defensively. I look at teams like Texas A&M. Joe, I mean, look, uh, mm -hmm. we talk about A&M all the time. They were eight, nine win team, a uh, uh, year uh, win team every year. Eight wins. Well, why did they continue to lose this year? Somebody goes down, they're playing a true freshman, and it does not bode well. Bottom line for me is with them, I look at their schedule. I don't think they're winning week two. As much as I might, I may not like Alabama as a fan of college, like my team, I don't see them going into Tuscaloosa and taking down Nick. There's, I, I just don't see it. I think you're going to lose one or two Big 12 games. It's just where I sit. Here, uh, before we end up, Moving on to talk about the uh, the realignment stuff. Here's the really crazy take to to you know to cap us up off off, off nice, nicely here. I would hope that Texas fans are realistic and agree with me when I say this. But outside of some of the flaws that we talked about, this team can and should, if we look at them on paper and all those guys progress, should win ten regular season games or more. 